Does that invite... Alright, and that does invite Jark as well. Okay. Um, make that go away. Go back here. Double check my OBS. Uh, Alright. So, let me just make sure. Uh, recording general. Okay. Jark is recording. Uh, my OBS is set up correctly. Uh, I guess it's time to begin. Um, so, uh, the end of the last game had uh, some some stuff went down. Um, some some people were left behind, and uh, the galaxy was in a bit of a state of limbo. And then um, and then. We did a 10 year time skip. So for today's epilogue, I'm, and also uh, sort of in place of a pregame question, I'm just going to ask you guys all, uh, what have you been doing for the past 10 years? Um, in case anyone has not done it yet, uh, go to Discord and check out that document I just dropped in there. That is a, a uh, rough overview of what has been happening in the galaxy since uh, since the end of our last game. Um, how many people read through that? I'm reading through it now. I did. I skimmed it. Okay. Um, so, uh, Zai, since you read through it, um, yep. Where is Roy in the galaxy? And you can you can skim through it if you need some reminders about how things have changed. Yeah. Um, so Roy and Roy has been traveling uh, the galaxy with Pascal. Mm. Um, their relationship <clears throat> has evolved into. If you've seen character world building, you would have seen it's similar to the relationship that Magneto and Professor Xavier would have had if they never stopped being friends. Um, Roy clearly more the Magneto, <laughs> Pascal more the MLK or the uh, Professor Xavier. Yeah. Um, so Pascal has been like sympathizing basically with I'm not going to go into this in case it's going to be talked about later with what Mate has been doing mm -hmm. um, or what Mate has done uh, so Pascal has been sympathizing with that he's on the side of unification trying to um, I guess lead to or help create a galaxy where the network and humans and everybody can live together in harmony and things are happy but Roy is still pretty much of the opinion that organics are hurting more than they're helping. He's not as much of a outright speciesist anymore. Yeah. Um, he, he doesn't hate organics. He never really hated them, but he, he doesn't have as much open animosity towards organics. Um, so they have recently been just going across ruined worlds um looking for scraps of network machines um trying to bring them back online um while simultaneously uh trying to it, they, they've been looking for survivors both of both of the network and of the thoughts um I'm Roy's been trying to track down like other thoughts that during this that interregnum that that period of time where before Mendenshire and all those cronies came roaring back into the scene mm -hmm. um trying to basically find lost souls you know people who were or lost thoughts um they no longer had their guidance Mendenshire had basically controlled their mind 
um mm. he no longer does they have no purpose so it's almost like a universe full of, or a galaxy full of ronin but mm. they're like batshit crazy ronin <laughs> um, so two thoughts one um i imagine that once uh mendenshire and Hyronius reappear in the galaxy and they reignite the second major galactic war. Uh, I imagine that you're uh, looking for, like, you know, survivors to recover involves a lot of scrounging through, um, like, crawling through old battlefields, which is. Yep. There's a lot of scavenging going on. <laughs> Such a good mental image. Um, um, but I'm not. I'm not quite done yet. Uh, during that, those events. And this is something that happened more recently. I'd say probably as of about a year, maybe two years ago. Um, Roy came across a elfin child or half elfin mm-hmm. child, um, a little girl, probably around the age of uh, ten. Or, okay. No, eight when she was found. Eight years old, so she would be ten, I guess, okay. when our when the next part starts. Um, he reminds him, she reminds him, a lot of somebody who the party lost very recently. Mm-hmm. Um, I haven't figured out a name for her yet, um, but she is a little spark plug. She's always causing trouble. She's always like getting her hands into shit. Um, and she's but she's and she started to look at Roy as a big brother Mm -hmm. um and Roy is strangely this is new to him like the things that the other thoughts that he's been searching for is what he would consider family um but the loss of Avalyn and the imprinting of this child has caused something different in him to make him look at this organic as kin. So mm. that's where his character development is. That's fantastic. Um, so I had one question. You were talking about um, the children of Mendenshire, who are the mm. the kind of imprisoned thoughts uh, being like, you know, rogues now. Um, mm-hmm. The question was, so... You mentioned Mendenshire being gone, but we had discussed the idea that um, Mendenshire uh, probably had quite a few, like, backup uh, bodies. So, Mm -hmm. what is the status of Mendenshire in the past ten years? Well, specifically, I mean... So, I I didn't know what was would conflict with your plans of the uh right now, what is it, the coalition gonna... of the new dawn i think it is you tell me what you have in mind and i'll work around it um what i here's what i know so, five years after the last game um the their time cube pops back into existence they come out of it mm-hmm. with like 200 years worth of um in the 2000 uh, something like that yeah. I, I don't i should know a specific number i don't off the top it's of the real bad <laughs> um they've been there for a long time they come back mm-hmm. with like a whole army and everything um so there is a there is a very small group not large enough to be probably thought about in like our larger galactic politics or anything mm-hmm. but there is a small group of beings called the false men mm-hmm. the false men are Menden shire's clones um, they have been trying to take control of those thoughts who were wandering the galaxy like Mad Ronin um, and been using them to do various things, but they are all at cross purposes. They don't have that unifying thought of or that unifying drive of the true Mendenshire, hence their name, the False Men. Um, and so like one of the False Men could direct some of the children of Mendenshire to attack one of the other false men. Mm. And they just have like this small little intra-gang war type of deal. Um, So what Roy has been doing is like some of these thoughts, they are able to actually like help and they're able to get them to 
like halfway houses uh, type of deals. Some of them can't be helped. Some of them are completely insane. Mm -hmm. um, and have been made even more insane by the false men. Yeah. So he's been having to kill them. Oh, man. That is so good. Um, so you mentioned very briefly at the beginning of this, you mentioned me, um, MFT. So we have not heard from me in quite a while. Um, and uh, during that 10 year period, I believe Mike said that MX8 uh, chose to rejoin with the network. Uh, do you, am I remembering that correctly? I get the impression yeah. you might know more. I, I think so, yeah. yeah. I'm pretty sure that's how we talked about it. Okay. Um, so, um, MX8 rejoined the network, which is, that's a lot. Uh, me is effectively gone, as you knew them. Uh, none of you have had any communication with them since they left, which we can say- As we knew him, I think, I think Pascal would still be able to contact some, something of what used to be made. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I can see that. Um. Go ahead. Sorry to interrupt. No, I, I, this is something where, uh, I don't necessarily know what the, you know, I'm not going to establish canon for Mike. And I actually think that Zai, you might know, you might have a better impression of where Mike was going with that than I do. So, um, I get the feeling that MX8 went to join, um, uh, they rejoined with the network for the purpose of um, uh, for the purpose of like creating some I don't know, doing some work from the inside as well as just that feeling of being lost they had from what happened with Avalon, but uh, do you know if I'm if I'm remembering that character motivation correctly? Uh, I am scrolling up to see if I can find where Mike talked about it. There's that text that he left Avalon. Hmm. Do you know where that, um... Yeah, well, I'll just read it real quick. I'm looking at it right now. Yes, it says, please. Avalon, it's been one year. I'm still not sure exactly what happened that day. Having processed that video file one a bunch of times, <laughs> like a couple million, I'm not going to itemize out that number, uh, and still coming up with nothing. I joined up with the Veiled Woman in the hopes I could find what I would need to make this right, to bring you back, to feel what Organics would say is whole again. I don't want to fight this any longer. I'm going to find a way to make sure you are brought back properly, but I know I cannot do this alone. I am going to merge my processes with the network. They will have an answer, even if it means losing out on who I have become. I don't intend to lose any more friends. If you get this message, it means I figured it out, and I'm sorry for not being here when you do. So Mate has basically merged with the network, gone, gone all Neo, merging with the source, in order to try to find a solution uh, for Avalon's organic death. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, so beautiful. I don't know what his progress is on that. I, I mean, it sounds like he thinks he's close. It sounds like he thinks he knows what's going on. Um, but that being said, it's still been 10 years. So... Yep. So, um... So, that's it for Mike and uh, Zai. Um, who wants to go next? Kevin? I can go. All right, so yes. uh, we left you, Emil, um, self-destructed, leaving billions of little Emil links scattered throughout uh, the time cube um, to fight Mendenshire and Ironius and keep them from being able to come back. We know that ultimately that failed. We do not... Uh, I'm going to say, I think it's more interesting if we say 
nobody has heard from any of those Emils since they came back. Um, but that doesn't mean they don't exist necessarily, but we'll see where we can go with that next season. Yeah. Um, I was for a mill. I was going to technically the a mill, although that kind of begs some like weird questions. Yeah. But like, um, becomes because it takes them a while to regenerate, mm-hmm. um, becomes a baby planetary governor. The smallest okay. the smallest <laughs> Hold up. The smallest stature planetary governor in the galaxy. <laughs> Oh, just, yeah, a little baby grew with a little, like, crown and stuff. Yeah, I'm Continue. not, I'm not, like, a tyrant, but that <laughs> would be, I, I don't know if I want to do the little, the little scepter, but in any case, um, I think that I, I think that the first five years are very, my story is very different during the first five years and the last five years. Yeah. The, um, uh, what's it called? The planetary governor thing just is kind of like, it starts out like establishing, you know, kind of like the way and way for this new community. And first five years is kind of uneventful because I'm basically like walking into the mantle of running like one of the rogue kingdoms right um, and then I, when before we get to the the five-year point um i do want to say i have i imagine that your story would intersect to some degree with the coalition, with the coalition of yeah the i'm getting there i'm getting there because Good. the coalition Continue. the coalition only is necessary after the eternal dynasty comes back and that happens at the five year mark uh yeah i guess because the the coalitions the coalition of the new dawn they so before before their coalition existed um you had the veiled woman and grand t uh working together to create something and then that thing that they that little seed that they started planting in those first five years grew into the It's community. a coalition. The rise, the rise of the Eternal Dynasty is kind of like a catalyst event for like the yeah. coalition growing much, 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 much larger. Um, and I'm thinking that I try to remain independent uh, in those first five years and I'd also like to, you know, using the available resources of a, that only a planetary governor kind of, like, has access to, all of my friends, like, travels throughout the galaxy, they find certain things, like, hotel rooms are just, like, there and paid for already. So good. And they don't know why, but that, I kind of, like, as best I can track them around the galaxy and, like make their travels easier at the five year mark when the eternal dynasty comes back Mm -hmm. i kind of like retreat from being i'm a planetary governor and i'm still like involved but i think i try to like join back up with roy at that point Mm. like and i think i spend many years trying to actually like find work because uh Zai, let me know if this is if I'm understanding this right. But I, I think yeah. I think that Roy is not trying to leave a huge footprint during their travel. Yeah, Roy hasn't been. And if I didn't make it clear with what I was saying earlier, Roy is not associated with any. Mm-hmm. Yeah, he's Which, been staying in like the Rogue Kingdoms and Free States areas. Right. Um. And so I think that like I I like retreat from my. I realized that, you know, what the Eternal... The Eternal Dynasty essentially represents the... Like... It's the what genocide I'm, of yourself. Yes, exactly, exactly. It exists on the corpses of millions and billions of me. And that's that's a little hard to cope with. Yeah. Um, so I think that I leave my planet, but at the last thing I do before I leave my planet is, like, put it firmly in the camp of the Coalition of the New Dawn, 
and I go out on a many years long journey to find Roy, who I assume is kind of my best hope for getting to the bottom of the origins of the Eternal Dawn. That's fantastic. Yeah. Um, I don't, I want to say, I think that Roy has been hidden so, like, carefully that I don't find, um, I, I don't find Roy until, I either don't find, I either haven't found Roy yet or right at the end of the 10 year period is the moment that I find. I kind of, um, so this is a question for Zai. Um, so the, uh, your trend group from the Space Fair campaign, as well as a good part of the, um, the Gemini, put together a, a 10 year um, anniversary of her death celebration for Avalon. And um, the idea is everyone is coming back together and meeting back up. Is Roy and or Pascal coming to that? Uh, I think Roy and Pascal would have reconnected with Emil right before that. I love that. That's good. Um, so Roy would be there. Um, hmm. Yeah, Roy would be there. I am not little anymore. Ten years is long enough for me to... Well, so we had discussed... Um, oh, right. We had discussed the possibility that you weren't little and then, like, at some point, like, a year ago, you got, like, oh my God, God, yeah. or something. Let, let, let's, let's say this. I was traveling to find Roy, and, like, six months before I actually did find Roy, I... I got like cataclysmed again. This time, not in like not a not a billion. I died. Pinky was yeah. like yeah. So I'm back to being little again. Mm. That's very good. It also means that um, Roy meeting back up with you was meeting up with a like one foot tall Amel. Which yeah, was fantastic. Yep. Uh huh. Okay. Um. So does that uh. That sounds like that wraps up your story up to the reunion. Up to the reunion. Okay. Which is kind of like modern times. Yep. So let's see. Um, I need to know about Ruda. And uh, is that the last of it before we get to Aeneas? I think so. Morgan. Yeah, I think so. Tell me what Ruda. So Ruda's been running. Canadian ninja warrior planet. He hey. just said, fuck it all. Um, and he's like, not involved with anything. So Pine trees and bare Uh, So I'm surprised. Um, did you... Uh, I, I'm kind of surprised that Ruda wouldn't get involved when the Second Galactic War started back up. I totally imagined Ruda being like, general or some kind of army. He retired. Okay. Yeah, Jesse. That's interesting. Okay. Um, Until... The root of the armchair <laughs> revolutionary. <laughs> we'll see what happens ten years later, you know? Okay. Um, so, you are meeting back up with the group for the reunion having spent the, the past ten years kind of watching from the sidelines? Did Ruta have a SLC punk moment where he was just like, I didn't sell out, I bought in? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Almost immediately. <laughs> okay. Yeah, he's like purposely ha trying to avoid everything that's going on for 10 years. I and when he comes back, he's got an eye patch and he's got like a pretty thick beard. That's great. Does does he tell anybody why he has the eye patch, or does he like refuse to explain it and keep it all vague, mysterious? He says, he says randomly, like, "Call me Bliskin. <laughs> but he doesn't go into details. I love that. Um, Just a gardening accident. Are you? Uh, have you been running uh, Space Canadian Ninja Warrior with um, the Tickler? Oh yeah. Yeah, that's what I thought. Wait, wait, wait. Can we? Can we? Yeah. I, I... Can we say, or would it be appropriate that like Ruda doesn't tell us 
why they lo- like he lost the eye because it was televised anyway. So you should. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this again. Okay. Um, That's definitely true. <laughs> I like that. Okay. So. Uh, so that leaves us with just one person left. Um, Aeneas, I asked you to, so, so we worked together on, obviously we can't talk about what Avalyn has been up to for the past 10 years, cause she's, you know, dead. Yeah. Um, but. And in another dimension. And in another dimension. That's a good point. Dead in another dimension is extra fun. <laughs> you double dead. Um, except it's like a 5D like hypersphere dimension. So you're like dead in like extra dimension. So good. Um, so we asked you, uh, I asked you to do um, Anwar, who uh, who has a new name now as people are re-meeting them uh, 10 years later. What name did we come up with? Was this in a... Anwar. Yeah. Uh, you said what? Was this in our DMs that we had our com- this conversation? Yeah, this was in our DMs. Uh, Anwar is going by Mira now. Right. Which was... Uh, I don't know if I should tell everybody. Should, would Anwar tell everybody based on the reason I gave? I don't think he would. Or she would. I, um, okay. I don't think she would. I think she would say that it is um, to honor Avalyn. And when people ask, wait, what does Mira have to do with Avalyn? She just goes, hmm. Yes, absolutely. Hmm. <laughs> um, okay. Um, so... Uh, ten years have passed. Uh, Anwar is a girl now, named Mira. Um, so, do you want to uh, go through some of the history we came up with during that uh, time period? Yeah, absolutely. So, first and foremost, we're going to jump back ten years, back into the sad times. And uh, <laughs> Avalyn died. Roy was... And I'm sorry for this, Roy, but Roy was... I don't even think ripping the band-aid off properly describes how Roy decided to just tell everybody about how Avalyn died. <laughs> but, uh... Brutality. Anwar, <laughs> Anwar was very upset with Avalyn's death, like, completely shell-shocked by it. Like, spent some time just kind of receding in on himself and, like processing his emotions and he eventually got to a point where he wanted to keep finding himself and well and i think that was exacerbated by the fact that their like one of their last conversations together was that um that uh the sermon with otema Otema's sermon where yeah talk like about, like identity and purpose and self but yeah like it was definitely like oh man that's oh <laughs> so like one of the last times Anmar ever sees Avalyn they're at this sermon of Otema's and they're having this like just wonderful genuine conversation about identity and both of them wanting to find themselves and like they make this promise to like both keep up on each other and like make sure it's all going to happen and then the group comes back from their next mission and Avalyn's just gone. So Anwar was fucked up for a while um, and after he took some time to grieve he kind of you know as Bren said like was exasperated to keep going on that journey and finding himself and eventually uh Anwar transitions and starts going by the name of Mira and she's she's gorgeous and um me and Bren discussed this a little bit and I'm sorry that I'm rambling with this it was just it was a lot <laughs> but uh we have like pages and pages of <laughs> going back and forth about this but um we <laughs> had a little discussion about uh basically when Avalyn like died since the Gemini was like basically her 
de facto home. Like, she was always going to be there no matter what. She looked at the party and, like, the rest of the Gemini as her family. She didn't have, like, a legitimate will, but it was eventually, like, like, the party knew that Avalyn would be fine with everyone, like, splitting up her things and the rest of it just going to the Gemini. And Bren and I decided that Mira ended up getting Avalyn's entire closet and uh, working with Otema to alter a lot of those clothes so they would work for her since, you know, Avalyn was a human and, I think and that- Mira's <laughs> an Alvin. Um, so I think that Otema... I I kind of imagined that Otema ended up being the, uh, what's it called, executor of the estate. Um, Avalyn didn't have a will. Otema is basically a priest and was her best friend. And I think that Otema definitely was the one who ended up saying, like, this is what Avalyn would have wanted. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, so so, um, Mira and Otema helped Mira with... um, altering Avalyn's clothes, which are fun because um, Mira wanted to have that that symbol of, of like, inheriting Avalyn's closet, even though it's like, it's a silly thing, it's just clothes, but to her it's important. Um, but Mira is like, Mira's like six foot eight and has four arms um, and much bigger than Avalyn, who was a small person. Uh, so I imagine there's a lot of getting creative with how, how they... do you even do that? We talked about a lot of, like, you take one of there's Avalyn's of baggy problems. jackets and make it into a Or, um, <laughs> we, we talked about the idea of, like, taking one of Avalyn's, like, graphic tee and, like, cutting out the... the image on it and sewing it onto the back of a jacket um something like that kind of stuff but definitely a lot of getting creative right yeah yeah um continue so um i hold on let me find my place so now we get into the future and um this is discussed a little bit on the 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 document for spacefare part two factions so when i originally sent this along i basically decided that uh mira like continues to work with the gemini just because like that was what felt what like you know most comfortable to her because like she had aligned herself with the party she was working to be a doctor and she continued working on that like she kept working as like both the party and the Gemini's doctor but I think that she also went ahead and aligned herself with the children of the warp to also honor Avalyn and uh in the the spacefare part two factions you will note that the children of the warp at this point have joined up with the coalition of the new dawn along with their scion communities and their fey allies and um we didn't have a lot of time to dig into the, like, the politics of the warp, but the warp has its its own kingdoms and lords and, like, its, its own community that's happening in the, you know, in this extra dimension. Um, and so one of the things that uh, maybe we'll get to in uh, part two is... Um, in addition to this being a war in your galaxy, it's also a war in the warp, where you have, you know, the demon lords and the the primarchs and um, all of the the fake communities all having their own place in the war in that war. So the fact that you have the children of the warp on your side, even though they're a very small faction in the material galaxy, they're that's a big deal in the war in the war. Oh yeah, definitely. But uh, there's also that line. Like, I'm wondering how we're like. Do you think that uh, Mira would have like? Do you think she still retains her like children of the warp ties, or like did the children of the warp get entirely like 
Like, is it like one of those things like in Naruto where it's just like, yeah, you know, we're all our villagers, but we're the fourth great ninja <laughs> alliance or whatever right now? Uh, I think they, I think everyone kind of kept their own um, identity and the coalition is more of like an alliance. Okay. Because uh, I was also looking at the uh, second line, or not the second line, but the ch- the line after the Children of the Warp mention and the Grand T mention about the uh, group of Alfin. Mm-hmm. Um, I just think that's super cool. Did we? Uh, no, I think I want to. I, w- I want to DM about that or something. I'm gonna ramble, so go ahead. Okay. <laughs> um. So, uh, so, um, during the Second Galactic War, um, Mira is, uh, just serving on the Gemini as a doctor, right? She's not, um, serving in the front line anywhere except to be working with the Children of the War. Yeah, definitely not. I think for the most part, Mira was in a situation where for the most part, she was on the Gemini helping out as a doctor or like occasionally going out and doing field work, but mostly related to like medical field work. But occasionally she does like, you know, jump around for like a Children of the Warp contract in the same way that mm-hmm. Avalon did. Yeah. Okay. Um, so that is the last of our... Um, that is the last of our people, and that brings us to the reunion. So, um, I, okay. We can do a scene with you guys all at the reunion and actually play out you guys doing that, but it would be all just you guys role playing with each other, basically. Um, We've already discussed what everyone is um, has been up to. Do you want to directly do that scene, or do you want to just say that that is kind of where we end it? Is it the context that everyone has all just said, and then you guys meeting together in the bar in the Gemini and? Um, and then that will be kind of where we pick it up. That seems like a good starting scene for season two. That's what I'm thinking. Does that does, does everyone feel that way? For sure. Okay. Um, it, yeah, it, let's really see a whole lot of. I was getting a whole lot out of it. We're role playing it right now. Yeah. Um, is there any um, are there any questions that need to be answered to anyone? No, we're we're good. Yeah, I don't think so. All right. Um, I have a lot of emotions about this campaign, and I'm really happy with how it went. Um, that said, it was incredible. Yeah, it was it was great, and I'm really excited that we are going to come back to it for a part two. And I'm also glad that we're going to get some time away from it before we come back for the part two because. Um, <laughs> because it'll be good. It'll be good to have that uh, to have that break and recharge and all that stuff. So I'm pretty good pasting... to give it time to marinate. Yes. So I just pasted in the general channel um, the uh, link to our new campaign. I think most of you have joined it. Uh, uh, oh, it's giving me a not authorized page, but I am logged uh, in, so. Okay, hold on. Hold on. Hold on. Ah, I got it. I need to copy the share link. That's what I need. Ah, Brent, this is weird. I was in it. Cause... Are you sure you're, ro- you're logged in on Roll20? Yeah. Oh, okay. Um, Try clicking that share link that I just sent. Uh, yeah, I'm joining now. Thank you. All yeah, right. that's weird. I was, I was, so I played on that server before. Mm-hmm. Um... So, let's see who all is online. We've got a Zai, we've got a Jeff, we've got an Aeneas, we've got a me. We are waiting on Morgan and Kevin. I'm watching. I'm here. Oh, wait, hold on. Let me go back in. 
Am I missing anyone else? Uh, just in case anybody else needs to do it, my roll 20 settings were like reset on this new game. So you might need to reset if you're broadcasting on roll 20. Uh, you scroll down near the bottom, make sure you set it to, uh, do not broadcast. And also I recommend setting it to the, um, player video avatar size thing. Uh, set it to just names only. Um, just to have a nice slim visual profile there. Wait, how do we make this not broadcast? I'll help you. I'm coming. Okay. Okay. Um, nope, I gotta... I'm going to adjust this a little bit. Let me make sure. All right. That is correct. That is correct. That is correct. That is correct. Um, you should all be looking at this starting page that has our little shards in the sky thing. It looks like a little notebook. And it's got two big transparent sticky notes saying pre-game checklist and post-game checklist. Everyone is seeing that? Yes. Okay. Um, so, uh, most of these are just reminders for myself. Uh, I need to remember to um, have you guys keep an eye out for crafting supplies. Um, nope, we're nope, nope. going to do haunt checks for Morgan. Uh, difficult terrain. I have a whole extra sticky note for how to do combat stuff. Um, and pregame question... I think, well, let's start with just getting everyone's names. Let's start there. I don't, most people don't have established names. I think the only person who has an established name right now is Zai. Um, Get on my level, y'all. Oh, um, God. So, uh, hold on, I'm just going to go to a name generator. Sorry, wrong way. <laughs> I mean, yeah, so I actually <laughs> really recommend. Oh, can't think of one? I guess I'm just built different. Go to the behind thing, matches the vibes of your character, and uh, just plug it in. Um, I'm going to be dropping. Uh, you guys should be all should all be on a like world map kind of map right now. Um, I'm going to be dropping everyone's characters in momentarily. Mm. This is exciting. It's very exciting. Um, very excited to play this. Yep. Uh, so one thing, we're going to go over how all of your characters ended up with the village. Um, I'm just going to call it the village for now until we come up with a name for it if we even do. Um, so it will probably be good to mention uh, some some preamble, some prologue. Uh, your characters... So the, the context of this campaign, it's going to start without having a, you know, a direct goal, as I think all the best stories do. Um, and your, your main thing for the start part of the campaign is just uh, you guys are settling a new colony on a abandoned like island, an abandoned shard in the sky that um, used to have a civilization on it, uh, but they are all gone. No one knows why. Uh, nobody else has wanted to settle this place because it's considered cursed, but you guys are desperate for real estate and it's free real estate. Somebody drop in the it's free real estate gift for me. <laughs> That's a thing, right? Oh, it has oh, There's many of them. Um, so... <laughs> There you go. Oh, thank you very much. Um, Bryn, Bryn, can you just um, give a quick summary about the shard system and its kind of plane of existence again one more time? Yes, I would be happy to. Um, let me see if I have... Um, I'm dropping an image into, uh, I'll drop it into the general tab.
Um, so this image I just dropped in was the uh, key concept art for Shards in the Sky. Um, I guess I can I can drop it in Roll Twenty as well. That's probably well. Oh man, it's such a good song. Um. So. Uh, make sure it's capturing. It is. So, um, the idea here, uh, this picture I sent you only shows a handful of shards. Um, these, these floating islands are what I call shards. Literally, the last remaining shard of a planet that has been utterly destroyed, um, and only one chunk of it is left floating through space. Um, but uh, you end up in, uh, these planets all ended up in a place called the Ever Realm, uh, which is, uh, it's not space, really. It's not filled with, with stars and darkness. Um, it's more of uh, kind of what medieval philosophers imagined the universe as. It's a giant, almost, unimaginably giant sphere that you are all inside of. Like a giant fishbowl. Um, a globe of fluid called ether. <laughs> on the top of it is um, is this it's almost like painted but it's painted with this like glowing sky material and um, that glowing sky material is what gives you daylight and on a regular cycle the glowing sky material dims and that's what gives you night um and uh at the bottom of the sphere let's say the the bottom 25 percent or something of it is uh flooded with this black inky nothingness material called the void um and that is the space that all of these shards exist in uh the shards just float around um they move constantly so um if you live on a particular shard and one year you know the shard that is your neighbor one year might be like you know uh, uh, during the next year, and it might be like totally out of reach the year after that. Um, the all of the shards are constantly migrating, but not in a pattern that anyone understands. Um, there is some special. Uh, there are a few different things that are special about the air between the shards that make travel between them easier than would normally be the case considering you're just walking through open air. Um, for one thing, there is an almost constant updraft anywhere except for on top of the shards themselves because the shard blocks the updraft. Um, and because of that, you can take literally just a hanging glider and fly from one shard to the other. But uh, it's very hard to fly over a shard because you immediately lose that updraft as soon as you go over the ledge. Um, and uh, because of that, one thing we're going to have in this campaign is you guys are going to be doing lots of traveling from, from shard to shard, visiting all your neighbors, uh, but you're almost always going to have to dock on the coast. You're not going to be able to fly directly into the middle of it. Yes, Kevin? What's the glide ratio on my glider? Um, so <laughs> your glider, uh, well, uh, I mean, I don't know yet. Uh, I was about to say, I have business questions. <laughs> yeah, I, I will say there's, um, there is also the, there are things you can do with a dedicated personal, um, flying apparatus that um, cannot easily be done with um, 
large transport vessel. So the yeah. ship that you guys used as your um, as your like colony ship as you're flying to your new home uh, will not be able to fly all the way over a shard. I but an individual with an individual glider would be able to do more if they just let the boat rise up very high and then and then just like wind it down. Why did it but you're, you're not going to I could I could see them designing this world because there's a constant trap. Wouldn't design because things are ripped without them. Mm-hmm. That way they can carry more cargo. Yep. That makes sense. Um that makes sense. So uh the the shards themselves, the little islands that are floating in this world, uh, every one of them is the remnant of a different world that has suffered an apocalypse. Um, I originally described this as, like, planetary graveyard. This is where the remnants of planets go after their planet dies. Uh, or maybe, like, a, like the afterworld of planets. Um, so, because of that, you're going to get something a little bit similar to what we had in Space Fair, where there are, you know, millions of worlds to visit, and all of the worlds have their own culture and their own history and stuff like that. Except, um, here, you're not jumping across light years to get to the next planet. It's literally like you get in your sky boat and you hop over to the next planet. Um, so, sorry for the music. I, I accidentally put it in general. So, um, I also, uh, there is some more to say about the, I mean, there's a lot to say about the world building, about how the magic system works, about the, the gods and Aeon, the different planes of existence and all that stuff. But, um, does that primer give everyone a good starting point to, kind of remember where we're at with this world. I guess um, the only remaining question I really have is who put them here? Or is that like part of the campaign that, that we're going to be going looking into? Be, uh, nobody knows. There are a lot okay. of theories. There are a lot of religions that claim that their religion has the here. There is no public knowledge agreed upon thing for why these planets are all here. The one thing that you have that um, might be closer to like a starting point of a clue is that every one of these shards seems to have their own distinct, unique uh, guardian creature called an Aeon. Um, And that guardian creature, uh, some people speculate that it is the a physical manifestation of the soul of that planet. Um, We don't know. I mean, again, lots of religions have their own theories they have come up with about what that means, but nobody knows for sure. Um, One other question, kind of mm -hmm. a two-parter. Do these shards have their own day-night cycles? Indicator of like a sun and a moon. They all share the same uh, day night cycle of the Ever Realm. Okay, what about weather? Uh, they all share, they, they all have their own unique weather. Uh, and the weird thing about these shards is um, it's not only dry land, it is, uh, it, you can think of it as like you take a tectonic plate from that planet, draw a wall up around the edges of that tectonic plate and then just lift it out of the planet. So all of the water on that tectonic plate is, is also trapped in place. And all it of the- It spilling off the edge. It does go spilling off of the edge, but it's infinitely too. And only in very aesthetic ways where there's like- Yeah, this is just stuff. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> also, the weather that would be happening in that, um, it's its almost like this isn't, this space you're in is not a purely physical space. It's almost more like, um, like you are stepping into a photograph of that 
planet at that time. Um, that's not a good way to put it. That has some wrong implications. But uh, the you know if we if we cut a um, if we cut off whatever tectonic plate Maryland is on, um, and that became the shard of our world, then you would still have the East Coast, you would have the ocean, you would have our biome exactly as it is. Uh, the only thing that would change is the history of what has happened in that world since the time of its apocalypse. And um, it's it's no longer a dynamic system. It's kind of in. I mean, it's a dynamic, so like there's birds and stuff, but the biome is locked in place and you can't like alter that without seriously yes. altering the like and this is where well, this there's is weather where, but not seasons this is where the migration gets really interesting because um so one of the ways that you can travel between shards um other than with an airship or a glider is um sometimes clouds will gather around the edge but they're not Reg they're not normal clouds. They're not um, condensed water like we have in our world. They're more like clouds the way they're depicted in old-timey cartoons, where it's basically just like big fluffy pillows that you can walk on. Um, and so when two shards get close to each other, uh, you can sometimes walk the cloud bridge from one shard to another, uh, which has led to you know, uh, biological migration into, from, like, you know, the kind of world that has dinosaurs on it to the kind of world that is, like, you know, East Coast America. Do the... Are avian and flying species just the completely dominant life forms of this world because they can charge they want at any time? They are... They are by far the most diverse um, eco thing. So, um, very few shards uh, have the same kind of avian life that they did when their planet died. They have invasive species that have kicked the old ones out, and also the species that were there originally have migrated to. It gets all crazy. Um, that. At a meta level, that explanation is why um, you guys are going to find a few species that appear in um, multiple different shards. So why you guys will sometimes find, like, I don't know, let's say, like, wargs. Like, you might have a warg that appears in multiple different shards because uh, that species happened to, like, very prolifically travel a lot. Um, the other thing that's important to mention here is that I mentioned the, you know, these plants having an apocalypse and ending up here, and that might make you think of, uh, of the apocalypse as, like, the now of the story, but in very few exceptions, Zai's planet being one of the exceptions, um, most of the shards in this world have been here for centuries or millennia. Um, so the vast majority of the places that you're going to visit are places where everyone who is living there and everyone they have ever known has always been living on that shard. But you might have some ancient like myth about what happened with their planet that ended with their planet getting here, but, um, by and large, it's just become its own new, unique, separate world. So, that was a lot, but did that give everyone a good foundation of where we're at with this campaign? Yep. Yeah, hey. so. okay, just I as a reminder, Nazar's world was a 
1980s alternate Earth, where the satanic panic was actually a real thing and led to the destruction of the entire planet. Okay. Okay. <laughs> so you're going to be getting a lot of 80s references from me. Is there going to be a lot of, like, was... Wait, so are you saying that Reagan was the good guy in your universe? I'm not saying he was the good guy. I'm just saying that the satanic panic was real. Okay. I mean... I'm not thinking Ronald Wilson guy. Reagan 666. You ever seen the first episode of Boondocks? Ronald Reagan was the devil. <laughs> oh my god. No, that's that's very good. Um I also have to imagine that um in your world there were teenagers who played Dungeons and Dragons and then actually did join Satanic cults and summon the devil. Yes, absolutely. All of the horrible things. They those were real in this world. <laughs> okay. Um, okay, so uh, everyone go back to wall 20 and uh, I'm uh, gonna pull up your characters here. You guys should all be looking at this uh, this continent. This continent is going to be your home shard. This is where you guys are going to settle in your village. Um, and then this will be like your home base that you'll operate out of as you go to visit other shards. A lot of ruined, uh, a lot of ruined buildings. Yep. Um, so this shard was once a, um, it was once populated, uh, it has been abandoned for the past several centuries. I mean, nobody knows for sure because of the way these migrations go, but, um, Word of mouth has it, nobody settles here because this uh, shard is cursed. But, again, you guys aren't in a position to be picky, so you figure you're going to try your luck. Sure. Um, okay. So, okay. Hey, Bryn. Yes. I'm trying to think about my own backstory here, and you mentioned that a lot of these shards have been around for, like, millennia in this universe, right? Yes. Um... So for you, it is important that we talk about the um, <clears throat> the uh, planes of existence. So um, in in our universe, uh, the forces of reality, um, you know, heat, gravity, electromagnetism, all of these things, uh, are all exist in the same place evenly and they make up our universe. Um, in the Ever Realm, there is the material plane, which is kind of, you can kind of think of it as like the, the tip of the iceberg showing above the water. And then beneath the uh, material plane and making it up, there are dozens of intersecting and overlapping elemental and metaphysical planes that um, are each kind of uh, their own separate ever realms that follow the same kind of idea. Um, so uh, we had speculated that your character um, might have been uh, either grew up in the plane of frost and then traveled to the material plane at some point or you were from a world that was originally in the plane of frost and your whole world uh somehow slipped into the material plane and that's how you are here um it is relatively common to hear that 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 is a fairly common story of um somebody you'll you'll meet a lot of like um fairy type creatures that uh, come from the plane called the Feywilds and it's like yeah that's where we were originally and then there was a th our world intersected this world and we ended up over here and we decided to just stay that kind of thing did that answer your question? uh yeah sort of I still feel like I lost to, at some point about just how I am knowing the people around me, sort of. Well, um, How our origin stories of a group of travelers began. We don't know that yet. Um, if, I think we can do that now. Um, 
before we do that, I think the first thing we should do is probably come up with everyone's names. Because right now, we have one name in the party, and it's Nazar. Um, so, Zai's character is named Nazar. Uh, okay, clear it out. That was 80s reference number one. Oh, God. Uh, does anyone <laughs> else have an idea of a name for their character? I do. I sent you a DM because I wanted to make sure I was pronouncing it right, and I thought you might know. Right, let me check. Let me check this. Uh, uh, I do not know, um, but I think whichever way you want to go with it sounds pretty cool. I like that name. All right. Awesome. I think I'm just going to go with Hela. Hela. Hela? Yeah. Cool. I'll put it in chat. H E L A H. Ayla. Oh no. You know I'm gonna make a lot of holla jokes about you, right? I love it. Both in the in the holla back girl <laughs> venue and the holla bread uh, venue. Okay. So we've got um, our Disciple of Darkness assassin, Hella. We have our um, bard who how, uh, like manipulates the forces of the, the beast uh, through his uh, powerful heavy metal vibes, uh, Nazar. Uh, and then we've got yes. uh, Jeff, Kevin, and Morgan. Kevin's got his hand up. What do you got? Ezra. Ezra? Ezra. It's in it's in general. Um, e Z E R O C. That's actually really good. Yeah. It's random name generator, I will admit. But oh, it's good. It was good. It was A. Hey, it's I like it. Ezra. Okay. Um Ezra is our um, you are like an insectoid creature that, um, is, uh, you're, you're one of the scouts for the village, um, with your, you have an, uh, is it called an ornithopter? 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 Ornithopters are, uh, yes, that's like the insectoid, it's, it's right. biomimicry insectoid-like flying right. wings. Um, I thought my wings were just there. Yeah, no, you have you have wings. I thought you discussed your character having a flying device that you used when scouting. Oh yeah, I did. I did. So um also I think that I am like a scout for hire, and I have recently been hired by this group. Okay. So that's where we're gonna start. I'll morph yep. it into So you like will be that. working closely um with a girl named um Trisha? I'm pretty sure. Uh, K-H-R-Y-S-H-A, Krisha. Um, Krisha is a, a lizard-ish winged humanoid. Um, I, we would think of her as being somewhere in the draconic humanoid uh, umbrella. Um, and uh, she's very punk rock and cool. So... Uh, she is the other primary uh, scout of this group. Um, Ezrak instantly gets a crush. Fucking so good. Okay. I know um, why. I know why my character is staying in this job. Okay. Um. So, the thing with um. So your whole party are going to form the uh. The scout core of this um, of this group you will be the ones who go uh, boots on the ground to do whatever work needs to be done in, uh, you know, foreign lands. Um, uh, Krisha is more of the uh, surveillance, so she will do, she will work with um, Ezra to do uh, initial passes over a shard and get, like, the lay of the land stop at one or two places and pick up some rumors. Um, but she is going to be 
she is not always going to be with you guys when you do the actual right. journey. She does the, the initial survey. Um, okay, so we've got Ezrak, Nazar, and Hela. Um, we need a name for um, Morgan's character and Jeff's character. Actually, Jeff, you texted me a name earlier today, yep. didn't you? What's his name? Knock. With a K and, at the front, right? Yeah, with a K. And Knock is a um, an Earth and Ice warden. Mm. Mm-hmm. Okay, so is this Knock. What? Is it this one that I'm highlighting? Yep. Uh, I can't. Um, hold on. Yep, that's me. Okay. <clears throat> um. That was the only one that looked warden-like, so I was just I just wanted to make sure. <laughs> uh, and Nox's weaponry is uh, a pair of Ajas. Is that how it's pronounced? Uh, you, um, I think you're putting like a J in there or something. I think it's and, normally like Ajas. Ajas? Um, yeah. So they are climbing picks, or like ice picks. Yep. Um, cool. So uh, that, and then Morgan, um... So I was thinking we might just call your character Golem, but I think the construct like we're going Golem is fine either. But like yeah, I don't think he even thinks of, they even think of themselves as like having a name. I love Which okay. That? I like that. So Which one is Golem? Uh, the construct. I think the construct would call it call itself the construct. Yeah. Okay. Um. <clears throat> okay, then I'm going to put you down as the construct. Okay. Um. So, uh, and then, uh, Mike's character is going to be in the village as a like um, NPC for the first part of the campaign. Uh, and there is one more party member that you guys are going to meet in the near future. But for right now, that is um, the whole party. Uh, except the construct is not with you guys at first. Okay. Um, the construct will join us uh, shortly. Uh, for now, it is uh, just you four and uh, Krisha. Um, so. Uh, can I, do you, Do we have any other questions, or can I go into, uh, kind of getting us started? Well, I'm curious as to how we met and why we're traveling with each other. Uh, I um, that'd be in sure. No, that's, that's a good question. So, uh, the, the group that you're traveling with, um, is currently just called The Village. Uh, I think you guys haven't settled on a name and and by you guys i don't mean like you the players i mean i think the village itself has uh you're kind of holding off until you find something that feels right um so uh you have so we're looking for somewhere to settle is that because like the places that we were were like untenable or unlivable and stuff? yeah so everyone has different reasons um here, here, let me, uh, I'm gonna move you guys to a map. I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself here, but this is, uh, this is going to be the map that we, uh, are going to start on. So, um, this caravan here shows, uh, pretty much everyone in the village right now. It's, uh, it's a small group, but not, uh, you know, not bare bones. It's, uh, I guess, with the four of you, five if we count Kresha, we're probably looking at like 20, maybe 30 uh, people in this caravan. Um, so we've got the four of you who are the scout corps, uh, with, uh, working with Kresha, who is the four scout. Um, we have uh, the triumvirate that are uh, leading the village, and every one of them brought some amount of followers with them when they came together. Uh, I think that when they initially met, it was actually 
like a like a conflict, like a like some of them trying to you know claim resources from the others, but they ended up meeting together. Uh, stuff. Um, so uh, we have the th the triumvirate, the three mayors of the village. We have up here with the big sword, Eckhart, uh, who is um, an ex-slave. He led a slave re a slave revolt, um, uh, and then that group was the first group chronologically in the village. Um, he was then joined by <clears throat> Herbert who uh, was a <laughs> priest of a um, a large uh, traditionalist church um, who uh, had some views that were considered heretical and ended up getting exiled. But um, a couple of his followers went with him. Um, and uh, so he's kind of like, uh, kind of like Galileo. So we've got we've got Spartacus up here. We've got Galileo here. Um, and then the third one is uh, kind of the the bank of the party uh, or of the village. Um, she uh, funded the whole operation when they kind of came together. Uh, her name is Juliana. Um, she is from a group that we would think of as vampires. I'm just going to call her a vampire. Um, so she comes from a noble family, but uh, she couldn't uh, like claim any territory of her own uh, because she was, you know, not not in the right birth order. So uh, she is ambitious and wants to start her own kingdom, uh, and so in order to do that, she has kind of gone rogue and decided to, her kingdom is going to grow out of the village, and to that end, she is bankrolling uh, Herbert and Eckhart, and uh, the three of them together are trying to start something new, find a new place, a new home for them and the people who follow them, and then Along the way, uh, more people who have, have joined them who are looking for, uh, you know, someone to... They're looking for a new start. They're looking for something new of other existing governments. Um, we have a lot of people in the village. Do you want me to go through and introduce everyone? Nah. Nah. We okay. probably do that organically. So, uh, with those three being the leaders, and that kind of being the history of how this whole thing got started, and why they are looking for a new home as they are, uh, how did your characters end up with them? I have something if nobody else does. Yes, I want to hear it. So, wait, so... Hold on. we have to practice. Hella. Hella. Tell us, uh, uh, Helea, right? Hela. Hela. Um, Hela, tell us how you ended up with the group. So, <laughs> based off of some of the things that we initially talked about when we were first messing around with these character ideas, I love the idea that, like, the village is traveling around as a caravan right now. It's trying to find a place to settle. Like, Juliana specifically wants to fund and start her own kingdom. I think that basically while the village was traveling around one day, Hela smelled Juliana and she was just like, I don't know, I like that smell. That's a, that's a good smell. And, and she just kind of started following the caravan and eventually the caravan noticed they were being followed and, you know, Juliana and the others were like, what the fuck? And <laughs> like, they just had a nice, a nice chat and, and Hela explained that, you know, she was following them because she liked how they smell. Hey, um, so I want to propose something. Your character is a an acolyte of the goddess of darkness. Um, Juliana is a vampire. There's something there. 
Yeah, see, I really love the idea of once Hela found out that Juliana wanted to fund and start her own kingdom, she's just like, hey, so I might not look it, but I'm an assassin and, 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 and all kingdom people need like their own special assassins. So, I mean, you scratch my back, I scratch yours. <laughs> no, this is great. I imagine that also during travel, I think that you and Juliana are like, you are kind of like her right-hand girl, uh, if only because Juliana is constantly in a traveling in a carriage with blackout curtains, <laughs> and that's your vibe. Oh, absolutely. Okay. Duly noted. I think I would, take, I would probably prefer traveling around in that, too, because I think if I'm traveling around with her in her blackout curtain caravan, it actually allows me to see a little bit better, too. Oh, yeah, that's true. Um, well, see, the immediate surroundings of, like... Yeah. And, you know, her other uh, attendants. Um, I'm gonna definitely have to come up with some NPCs that are just, like... Uh, like her hand servants. Yes, we just had... We, we gotta develop the creep squad. I love it. So good. Okay, so that is, um... That is Hela and how she ended up with the group. Um, I can go next. Yeah, so Ezrak. I think that mine, um, I think Ezrak's fairly simple. I think yeah. I was literally just hired. I like I, that. I think that there's, I don't want to like belabor the point. I think that I was just hired as, for, you know, I think that people with wings are, have a set of skills that are valuable as for obvious reasons in, in a world like this. So they make lucrative uh, ways through life contract working their way for different factions and I've ended up here and we will see where this goes. Um, so the um, Oh, uh, I imagine the other thing that's relevant and uh this does tie back in, this does have a little bit of an a mill vibe to it, too. Um, your character, so we've established that in the village, so everybody in the party is going to have their own house in the village and your own work that you work on your vocations at. Um, your character has a, uh, it's basically like an ant farm if, if it was an ant, it was a a biodiverse insect did we, hive. Did we write all of the stuff down? Because I need to remember all of the stuff I did. Will Will I have parts of it written down okay. and most and using that as reminders? Yeah. Um. So I imagine part of that is in the village when you guys get settled, you're going to have uh, this like huge insect farm basically where you grow all of your specialized insects that you use for fighting and everything else um because you're in addition to being a scout you're like a farmer or, or a rancher more accurately i i will just assume that you are correct because i don't remember any but, of this but, oh, okay i am projecting here yeah or uh, assuming but your character uses insect eggs for your main weapon. You know, your attack is like you with a set of like vocations for me. I don't know. Okay. Um okay. we have them, but they're it's map maker cook, I think, which is also great. Okay. Um but an unlisted vocation that is part of just your class essentially. It is the source of your power insect eggs. Yes. And you have yes. to get those insect eggs. You are oh, yeah, you yeah, have yeah. some kind of setup that gets you a supply of eggs. Um, and I imagine part of that is you grow... Um, I want to say it's not even a conscious process. I would say that the insect in whatever territory I with just kind of like congregate around me and I just like walk down. Oh. They left me. I also like to imagine that you have a natural, like, you let out an aura that makes uh, insects in the area around you 
giant and yep. weird and yep. develop special powers. Yep. Pheromones. Wherever your house is, by definition, becomes a giant insect nightmare yes. park. Yes. So good. Okay. So I think that's the other reason I was going to why you might want specifically be working with you guys are group. cutting out a lot like every fourth or fifth word so. oh no um has that been going on for a while yeah about half an hour oh no oh no um <laughs> let's see that might just be because i was talking really fast um let me check my voice settings automatically determine i'm not sure it was both you and kevin yeah um Okay, so I I lowered the threshold that's required for it to pick up voice. That might do it. Oh, you know what else will do it? Um. Oh, my Ethernet cable is so far away. I'm gonna see if I can run an Ethernet over here. Kevin, what I was saying is, um, I imagine that there is also a certain appeal of having a place that not only offered you payment, but also offered you a place to settle down and grow your own nightmare colony. Oh yeah, that was a nice benefit as well. We'll, we'll see where it goes. I actually, I, I kind of don't want to pigeonhole, I don't want to assign too many like motives to this. I think I just have a, um, I think I'm just getting paid, and that's enough for now. Yeah, that's great. That's kind of, I don't want to. I don't want to overcomplicate it. I'm gonna shift us this way a little bit. Oh, sure. Okay. Uh, that'll do. All right, that's enough. All right, that's enough. Uh, put this here. Cool. You have, you have awakened Desmond. I'm sorry, Desmond. Okay. Oh, Hold on. We're getting there. Ethernet cable, you're so close. <sighs> okay, now nobody can walk through that side of the room. That's, That's okay. fine. <laughs> it's okay. Um, so. Alright, um. Okay, uh, so hopefully now that I'm plugged into the Ethernet, uh, and I've turned off that sensitivity thing, you guys will be able to hear me, hear us more clearly. Am I cutting out less? Yeah, you're good. Fuck yeah. Okay. Um. Yeah, you're good. So yeah, uh, I that I think that's part of the arrangement of why uh, you are. Well, maybe that's not why you came, but I imagine it becomes part of why you stay. We'll, get, see. we'll see. We'll get there. We'll I don't. I don't want to. I'm not. I wanted to. I want it to be more bare bones. And I'm like, and I, have, I have much simpler motives at the moment. Okay. Um. And uh, Jeff is not. Uh, not. Why are? Uh, why did you join the village? Was it just for a paycheck? So Nock is unhappy. Um, <laughs> he was wherever he was before this for a long time, and out of some necessity, he sort of had to leave there. Maybe he became kind of too dangerous, and so now at this point, he's basically a traveling refugee trying to find a new environment that he can um, settle in. And, uh, and so he's joined this band who seemed like they were also of the same mindset to try to find somewhere to, to settle and um it's a it's kind of a conditional relationship where he's probably uh kind of joining them until he can kind of find a niche a little bit away from any village that's established to probably set up shop in okay. he's very much a loner yeah right? great um okay so and uh Nazar. I, this is the most interesting hey. one. How did Nazar end up with this group? Um I, real quick question uh, about your background. So I know that your world was a um 
like 1980s demonic 1980s alternate earth very recently became a shard so so in your character's lifetime yes okay like uh, as in like uh i don't know 10 days before this campaign starts <laughs> oh boy like it just happened uh so nazar uh thinks that he's dead he thinks that this is all the afterlife um He's really confused about it because he can he still needs to eat and he can still get drunk and do all of the stuff that he did while he was living. Um, so, he's a little confused. But, uh, so basically when Nazar's world ended, uh, he was in a bar uh, playing, playing a gig or bartending or whatever. I'm not going into too much detail there. But um, he awoke sort of like that that half waking drunken stupor to see like the parking lot in front of the bar that he was in completely fallen away like that was the edge of the shard yeah, uh, and funny. there was one of those sets of cloud-esque pillows connected to this larger body of land that looked to be about a mile or two away um is he so from, he walked is he from 1980s los angeles in the san andreas fall <laughs> fall got right through the parking lot that he was in I mean, the fear of the big one was a, a, a total 80s thing, so yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh my god, that's amazing. Yeah, we could totally do that. Um, so he walked across this, this cloud bridge type thing part way and note and saw some figures in like a long line walking in a direction, and he kind of just started to walk up and fell in with them. He didn't really say anything or introduce himself or really try to connect with anyone he was just like uh well they're all walking in that direction so i guess we'll walk in that direction too there's nothing left here um and that's how he joined the group um so he has no idea at the beginning of this of his bardic or druidic abilities like this is all new to him oh that's fantastic okay great um yeah great uh so i think you've been uh so let me introduce you to the home that uh, most of you guys have been living on for the past uh, several years. So I'm pulling this down to like where your characters are at. Uh, let me just really blow that guy up there. So um, this is the ship that you guys have called home for uh, the past uh, for the people who have been here that long, the past, like, year or so, um, you know, on and off, you'll, you'll stop on a shard, you'll try settling there, things don't go right, you get a crew on, you know, another lead on somewhere you could settle down, and then you move on to the next place. Um, but this is, this is what we're looking at here. It's kind of a whole village built on... It's kind of like a village built on the roof of a plane. Um, so the the wings, and it, it also has a huge blimp that expands over the top to assist with lift. That like retracts and, um, and pulls in? Okay. Um, yeah, it, it's you just uh, turn off the, the hot air supply to it and then just hold it up. Um, so, uh, but... Because, again, because all of this is done with updraft, it, aerodynamics don't matter. Uh, which means the whole upper half of this thing is just, you know, real estate. It's pretty real estate. So that's where everyone has been living. Uh, there are dozens of um, little houses built on the top of this uh, airplane. And this airplane is uh, very big. Um, but, um, okay, you know what? Now is the time to, to do this. So I'm moving you guys back to this overview of the map. Um, you guys, you can see your, your ship with the blimp here. Um, you are closing in on the shard and um, looking for you know, the place that you want to enter at, because you know that once you touch down, you're not going to be able to fly in very far. You're going to have to do most of this on foot, uh, carrying your um, 
hauling your ship thing behind you in a caravan. Um, but uh, the first thing that happens is somebody needs to go out and scout ahead. So, um, Kevin, uh, who is named... Uh, hold on. Ezerak. Ezerak. Um, Ezerak and Krisha, uh, you two are going to do a quick uh, flyover scouting of kind of the the eastern rim of this uh, this shard. So, Kevin, you're going to do your first skill roll here. Um, can you find your character sheet? You can either go on the journal tab and get I'm trying to get do you mind because I'm, I'm switching playlists right now could you, could you t- make that roll for me I'm gonna okay I will I will I will be sure. ready in a second I'm just switching playlists um oh it was not gonna let me well whatever okay so um, who's scouting Ezrock and who else uh Trisha the the dragon lady okay um so the two of them are so, doing uh, a quick fly over to see where's a good place to land, basically. Nazar, having newly joined the group, is uh, is sitting kind of in a corner on the main deck, I guess it would be, of the ship. And as as Azarok is starting to lift off to go scout, he says, uh, Bugs. Why did it have to be Bugs? Fuck. Do I hear it? (laughs) Do I hear that? I don't think you wouldn't. (laughs) <laughs> he didn't he wasn't very quiet about it. Nazar is not a quiet person. <laughs> um hmm. Could I um when how powerful are my wings? Because I'm thinking if they're powerful enough, I'm gonna have They're a... powerful enough to lift you. Are they powerful enough to lift me and um Nazir? Um Oh, I take- also, Nazar is drinking right now. Not, He's got a bottle I, of whiskey. I would say it's kind of like I can lift a heavy thing for a short period. I think you could lift him into the air for a few seconds. Um, can I do that? Okay. I'm gonna, I'm gonna do that, and I'm just gonna be like, um, and I'm gonna like put him down gently, and then be like, why did it have to be humans? And I'm gonna go and then fly off. <laughs> <laughs> and it's that kind of flying away that every fly does when it's too close to your head. Yes. It's yes. the most unsettling thing in existence. All right. Well, I rolled a perception for you. You have a plus eight bonus on perceptions, but you rolled a three. So you didn't find very much to work with. Uh, but let me go ahead and roll D20 plus, say, five. Another 11. Okay. So, um, that just means that you guys are going to... So, you find this place. Uh, I'm highlighting it on the map. Uh, It's a bit to the north of where your characters were at before. Um, It's uh, sort of the northwestmost corner of the island. Uh Uh-huh. Um... Surrounded inside of mountains. uh, It's got mountains on one side of it. Uh, It's jungles leading up to it on the other side. Um, you can see from above that there are places where the jungle thins out and you can see the remnants of an old road. Uh, if you had rolled really well, I would say you get an idea of where the road, like the map of the road, but you guys didn't roll well enough to get that. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you're kind of just going to have to guess at the best place to land to get there. Now, the reason you decided on this is... This is, um, it's a castle town, so it, uh, it's abandoned. It has several buildings already in place that appear to be relatively intact. Um, and it has a castle, which could be very help- helpful for a lot of infrastructural things. Right. Um, it seems like a good place to aim as a, you know, starting town. Uh, and it's relatively close to the ledge, so when you guys want to... We could set up a, like, we could set up a port and then exactly. lead it right to the, which it might be what they already, what this place had already done. Um, yep, but, uh, you aren't able to find kind of the best place, so you, you end up leaving the park, or leaving the whole village through docking at the, at the edge there in just kind of a, 
like a uh, I think maybe like an old farm. Like it's it's relatively flat land. It's hugely overgrown with uh, what were probably once vegetables. They're now majority weeds. Um, and you're just gonna be bushwhacking for a while. Um, I'm gonna roll. Let's see. How should I do this? I think we're gonna roll a D4 plus. Yeah, I'm gonna roll a d4 plus three. One d4 plus three. And that's how many, uh, days it takes for you guys to, uh, get settled, um, and kind of wander around until you find the road and start making progress on the road. Okay. Six days. So, okay. it's, it's almost a week after you guys first land on this rock, uh, before you are able to, um, to get all set up, get on the road, and get to, finally, uh, the map that you guys are going to start actually playing on. So, now we're back here. Um, you have, you had found, a you know, a trail of the road, um, that you were following, and, uh, as you were following it, you had, um, you know, a crew of people in the front with, like, machetes and farming equipment, um, just kind of plowing through the jungle and clearing things out of the way of the road so that the caravan and the, um, the giant uh, ship, which is now partially collapsed and folded up, um, can follow behind. But you get to this spot here on the map, right about where your characters are standing currently, and you can see kind of the direction that the um, that the road was heading in. But you know, just a few steps later. The road is completely gone. You can't get through the foliage. You can't find any evidence of where the road is. So you're kind of just lost. Uh, or, or rather, you know that you need to find the road and the road will lead you to where you're trying to get to. Yeah. But you don't know where the road is yet. So, um,. Uh, I think the next logical step is for you guys to kind of split up, explore around, try to... We can do that. You know, everyone goes a direction and, you know, whoever finds the road uh, calls out and then you guys start exploring that way. Uh, do you guys want to do any kind of... Uh, I, I was gonna ask, do you guys have any kind of preparation you want to do, or anything else you want to try? Uh, I am going to mention real quick, uh, and I will, I will drop this into, is it better to do it in general chat or in, um, Roll20? Probably Roll20, so it doesn't get lost in the deeps. Um, I'm gonna give you guys a list of, uh, So, okay, so first I am pasting in your first objective on goal 20, objective 1, um, and this is the other thing. So you are all equipped with a, uh, a loud whistle. Uh, you can use to communicate. Um, so even over great distances, even with jungle between you, uh, people will be able to hear this whistle. And you know, a, a handful of different just like dot and dat calls. Uh, you've got one that means I need help or I'm lost. You've got one that means I found what we're looking for. One that means I found something interesting, but not what we're looking for and one that means do not come this way. Um, so that is your, your kind of starting setup. 
Does anyone have any thoughts or ways you want to go about starving this? Good sound. Hey, play. What's in the sky? Oh, um. So, uh, Kevin, do you want to um try flying up and give me a look? I'll do that. Yeah. Um. Do you want to open your character? Yeah. Just you just all double click on your character. Yep. Um. Uh, so I think this is probably going to be an athletics check. Okay. Um. To to fly up high, uh, high enough that you can get like a survey of the landscape. And because the whole thing is jungled, you need to get up pretty high. Uh, not gonna do it. So um. I tried. I tried real hard. Yeah, I think that you are, um, you're not actually able to get above the tree line because there's a fairly dense canopy above you. Okay. Um, Krisha, uh, gives it a try. She's able to get above the canopy, um, but she isn't able to get high enough to get a sense of, like, to get the big picture she would need in order to yeah. see, like, the real subtle variations in the shape of the canopy that might suggest where the road is. Um, Can you turn the music down just a little bit? Yep. I'm so, having, having trouble with this. So, um, That's perfect. So, you guys don't have much, but, yeah, that was a good suggestion. So, you guys need to uh, find the path. Uh, unless somebody has something particular they want to try, uh, the way we would do this is you decide how many group so, you can write let, up into. Let me, let's just go to players. Yeah. Um, I fly back down, and um, I mean, I can't. It's the jungle is too thick. I think we should get to the running water. I think we could use that as a. How do people feel about that? Yeah, running water. I think it's as good an idea as any. Uh, I don't want to put all our eggs in one basket, so is it okay if Hala breaks off into another direction to look for the road? Yeah. So, we've got one group that is going to be, um, Ezrock's group, and one group that's going to be Hala's group. Um, who wants to go with them, and who wants to go separately? Um, I don't know that Mizar would be going off with any group right now. Okay. Um, he would be wandering by himself, probably. Hmm. Okay. Um, I'll go with Hala. Okay. All right. Um, Kevin. Uh, hold on. Let me check my notes. Hmm. Kevin, can you make a nature roll for me? Yes, I can. Um. Not and Hala, I need both of you to look up your nature stats. I rolled an 11. Okay. Um, my nature is a... Mine's a zero. Roll that or... <laughs> my, my nature is a plus seven. Do you want me to roll that? Mm-hmm. I was going to say whoever is higher rolls it. All right. You tell. Okay. Um, I see the really <laughs> tapestry of nature. Okay. You are one with the trees. Okay. I love that these um, these skill rolls have built in uh, like phrases they display when you use them. So I think it's so cute. Try something athletic. But you two just both did. Try something natural. Um. And um. Twenty-seven. Wow. Nazar, can no. you roll a nature one? Um, 
nature. Nature. Not bad at all. Okay. So, um, so here's what happens. Uh, Knock and Kayla, uh, you guys split off in one direction. Um, you are able to find a something that seems a little bit different about the soil in one area and trace it for a while and get to a spot where the uh, the path of the road becomes more clear. You see where I moved your characters to? Yeah. Okay. So you guys find the correct path to follow for the road. Um, I do just want to note that Halo has been occasionally picking up some of this soil and just eating it. Like, yeah, we're definitely going the right way. Very good. Um, I also imagine that Halo is doing a little better now that you're under the canopy of the jungle than you were when you were just outside. You got all these. Yeah. To help you see. Um. Okay. Okay. So every time you pick up some soil and eat it, Doc shoots you a concerned look. <laughs> So and and she's just gonna look at him like what you want some I'm like hold it out. It's real good. good. <laughs> All right. So the first group to roll uh, sufficiently high finds the path. That is um, not group. Uh, the second group to roll sufficiently high finds a thing. So. Nazar, I'm going to take your character and I'm just going to put you off to the side for now. You found something and we will get back to you. Um, uh, Ezra, uh, anybody who rolls below a 15 is lost. Um, I had to roll a 3. Yep. Oh, I rolled an 11, but 3 yep. on the dice. So, um, here's what we got. Uh... So first of all, you you go for a while, um, you get the impression that like you know, I think you you like get to a dead end you aren't able to pass through. Yeah. And then you're going to have to uh you know that you're lost, you're going to have to do one of two things. You can either uh blow the whistle call for I'm lost, I need somebody to come find me, or you can keep going and try to find your way back. Over to try to fly up again. Okay, um, make an athletics. No, nope, no. Nope. Ironically, you can actually turn the volume up now. It got like really, really loud all of a sudden and then it quieted down. Yeah, some of the songs are louder than others. Perfect. 16 on my fly check. You know what? Uh, that is high enough. Um, you are able to get over the... Um, you're able to get over the cloud top and make out the, the roof of the colony ship, um, which is back where you came from. Now, now that you know where you are in relation to it, you can either go back there and start over, or you can keep going. I'm gonna go back and start over. Okay. Or you can move on to other people. So, um, you go back and uh, start over. I think, um, as you're heading back, I think Krisha, uh popped out over the treetops. She ended up just climbing the tree to the top and then jumping off. Mm -hmm. uh, and she catches you, and then she is going to lead you somewhere, depending on what happens next. Yeah. Um, Nazar, you have, uh, one of- Nazar, did you take one of the whistles to communicate with the other group? Whistle? No, I don't have any whistles. Okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. Okay, this is going to be good. Um. Um, so, Nazar. Sure uh... Okay, I've okay moved, I got out of the river. I've moved your character. Uh, you see where I dropped you on the map? Yeah. All right. So you found um, you found a trail that you've been following. You thought that, uh, you, well, I don't even know if you were looking for the road. But you found a trail. You followed the trail. And the trail 
came to a little um, bridge. Uh, it's actually made of iron, um, but it's like it's aged, but still intact. Um, you are able to cross across it, but on the other side, on the other bank, you see this weird building. It's got it's got a lot going on. It's got like an aqueduct. It's got this little like space needle thing poking out of the top of it. Um, it's parts of it look like a science facility. Other parts of it look like um, like they were made with just like thatched with straw. Uh, there's a lot going on here. Um, do you go to investigate? Do you go back? Do you what do you do? So. I think Nazar, walking along this jungle, see this and say, Ugh, I have no idea where I'm going, but they say no one is half the battle, but I guess the other half is this. Wild Stallions! And then he just jams a rip on his guitar really loud and starts walking across. Okay, very good. Um, you know, I don't have a whistle, but I have a guitar. <laughs> that's a very good point. Um... So other people hear your riff, but it's not one of the pretty agreed upon uh, calls, so I don't think anyone knows quite what to do with it. So yeah, no, I mean, and if you've seen Bill and Ted, then you know that the Wild Stallion's riff is really bad. Yeah. <laughs> oh, so I imagine the party would be like, what the hell is that? That cat's dying? Is that nails being thrown at a chalkboard? Yeah. Um, okay. So, you find something, uh, I think, hmm, okay, so, yeah, nah, uh, you guys are, you've established the road, you are heading back to, um, your compatriots, to the villagers, to, um, I mean, am, am I correct in assuming you would head back to let them know that you found a way? Yep. Okay. So, you're heading back, and um, as you're going, you see this creature come bursting out of the woods from the east. And um, it's a peculiar little guy. So I'm dropping him on the map here. Um... It kind of looks like a like a bunny. It kind of looks like an insect, or maybe some kind of sea creature in some ways. Uh, and it's vaguely bioluminescent, and also vaguely like transparent. Um, it's a strange looking little fellow, but um, it comes bounding out of the woods. Um, it sees you, uh, it seems to be in a, in a panic, and it seems to be trying to get your attention. Like, it's, uh, bumping up against your leg. What do you do? Which one of us is this? Oh, uh, I think both of you. I think it's trying to get both of you. Out of Nock and, uh, Leela. Well, um... I guess I'll ask, what is it if they speak, like, a common language to me? Yeah, does it freak out if I try to grab it? Uh, so... Okay, so... What it does is not the freaking out that a wild animal does when you try to grab it. It does the reaction that a cat does when you grab it, but it doesn't want to be grabbed. So it kind of just squirms a lot. Um, uh, it, Jeff, it does not respond to your, uh, comments and comments. And it's trying to basically, like, hump our leg? It's, it, it's trying to get your attention. So it's, like, bumping into you and then running away and then, like, looking over its shoulder. And if you don't tell him, then it runs back and, like, bumps into you and runs away and, like, looks back expectantly. Can, can can I, like, smell the area, see if I smell any other creatures? Ah, uh, mm, Because uh, I, 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 like, have a sense for that. Nice. Um, make a perception roll. 
Does your character not have good perception? I would think that would It's be literally zero. Because I'm blind. Like, well. Um. How could I perceive things? I'm blind! <laughs> so, Hala, if you're blind, um. Do you sort of require me to be with you? Like, if I didn't, like, leave your side, would you be able to get back to where you need to be? Oh, I'd be fine, because, like, we're under the canopy of trees right now, and I can kind of see, like, I, I get a general... I'm kind of like Daredevil if we're in dim light, basically. I was just basically. about to say, somebody throw fried chicken wings at her, she'll catch them all. It's Daredevil block. Um, okay. Yeah, so as long as Hala is in darkness, you can see anything that is dark. Um, so... Oh, so you have, like, explicitly night vision? Yes, only night vision. Oh, I see. Um, so, you guy, um, you, here's what I will give you. You are not able to make out any kind of detail, but it's both, just nothing. Um, you pick up, uh, there is something in the area that smells, uh, bad in a way that isn't, like, natural for this environment. This isn't, like, a dead, rotting animal bad. This is, like, chemical and... And is it in the direction that this creature is, like, trying to lead us towards? Well, um, with a 12, I think you're not sure, but it feels a little bit stronger in that direction. I'm gonna start following the smell. Yeah. Um... The creature starts leading you. Uh, knock? Yes, yes. I just I just found a spider on my keyboard. This is a terrifying moment. Uh, oh, God! Why does it have to be spiders, he says out loud. I swear it wasn't me. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, you guys are... Uh, it is leading you kind of like ducking and weaving uh, through these trees. Um, it... It gets to this stream over here, so, uh, I should be, hold on, I'm gonna do my little, like, let this get to you guys, um, it gets to the stream, um, it just bounces effortlessly across the top of the stream, uh, as if it is, like, weightless, um, but you guys are not able to do that, so, the river, the stream's not moving very fast, uh, you would get wet if you just forward across it. Um, do you have something else in mind, or do you just plop through it? Hey, so I, uh, I'm an ice man. Can I, can I freeze the river? Oh, uh, yeah. I, I, I think you can. I don't know all of your powers off the top of my head, but I know that we've established you have a lot of elemental powers, and every one of your elements is the ice version of that element. So, like, uh, if you do something that's like a lightning attack, it's cold lightning. Um, but you can just conjure ice at will. So, yeah, I'm, I'm assuming that I probably won't be able to really stop the entire river, but, like, rather just basically create a frost sheet over top of it that could be possible to reverse. Yeah, no, that's, that's great. Um, so... Uh, you're probably going to have to pass one at a time uh, so that you don't crack through the ice. But you make this little ice sheet, you pass, a, pass across, uh, and then Kayla passes across, and you get these names. It's just, just going to take me a second. Um, do you guys... Yeah, I imagine that was super freaky for Hala. She yeah. probably does not do good on ice. It's like, ugh! Especially because because this is um, in an opening where there are not things overhead. There's like, yeah, you maybe have to, have to take Nox hand. Well, I think you said that we had to go one at a time to make sure, so I think that, like, Halo, like, was very, like, I don't want to cross, and, like, not kind of had to, like, call out to her the whole time so she could follow his voice. Mm, that's very good. Okay. This, is, this is fine. I also would like to say that um, upon seeing your reaction to the ice, I tell you, if you'd like it, you can try to pick up some of it and eat it. Oh, absolutely. I'm going to eat it. Yes. <laughs> okay. Um... 
So now that you guys are, are this far away, I want to ask, um, are you going to keep going? I mean, I assume you're going to keep following this. Are you going to do one of your whistle calls to inform the other people that you have found something and are pursuing something? Or are you just going to keep going? I'm following the creature, the whistle, like, Hala's been taught the whistle calls. Hala does not do the whistle calls. She's like, meh. I'll, um, I'll hear some faint sounds of rock music playing in the distance, and I will whistle so <laughs> to communicate with it. Okay. Um, so, uh, uh, Kevin's character, who is named Ezra. Ezra, yeah. Um, Ezra, uh, Krisha thinks that, um, I think she says, damn it, they're not, they're not using the calls. There are specific calls for a reason, people. You want to go pursue that and see if they're in trouble? Um, how do I get this off? Not. That's it. Yes, let's do that. Okay. So, um, so at this point, we're going to switch to a new map. I have not created the map. Now it would be a good time for me to make the map. All right, background. Medium gray. And what is this going to be? This is going to be made. Oh, what's the construct up to? I haven't heard of the construct in a while. You're going to meet the construct very soon. Oh, OK. Um, um, I accidentally spoiled alert myself. Yeah, uh, I'm sorry we didn't have anything for you for the opening bit, Morgan. Um, hopefully the, the coolness of introducing your character will make up for that. Yeah, it's all good. No worries. Okay, um, let's see. I had a map for this specifically. Um, uh, 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 this one. Okay, um, I'm gonna move you guys over so you can at least get to watch as I put this in place rather than just waiting at the end. Um, so, our next scene takes place at uh, this cabin in the woods that you have found. Um, Oh, uh, properties. grab your hair. So everyone sees this um this new map I'm laying down. Yep. Okay. Um, now we've got Nazar. All of you guys, just a little bit bigger, so you can fill up these spaces nicely. You guys all see this, uh, this like white grid on the map, right? Yeah. Good. So your characters are not all on the map to begin with. Um, most of you will be appearing as uh, the scene goes on. 
Um, now... Let's see, I need... The drive. My drive. Right... Digging these musics, Kevin. Kevin, Jeff digs your music. It's like a sort of like boss battle music in uh, maybe some like new England. Yeah, yeah, I was gonna say the same thing. Now that that's a little intense for right now, I think. Mm -hmm. Um, we'll see. It might not be. Um, so there's a bear, uh, Nazar. As you are approaching this building. You see a, a bear come crashing into the clearing up ahead of you, um, and it is—it's uh, moving in a hurry. It's—it looks like it is running from something, not chasing something. Um, do you have any immediate reaction to that? Nizar. Can you hear me? Uh, I think I just missed whatever you said. Oh, okay. No, I, I said, hmm, because I was thinking about it. <laughs> um, I don't think Mizar would have any reaction other than to just stop where he is. Like, stop moving forward if he was. And try to see where it's running or what is chasing it. Um, he definitely wouldn't call out to it. Um, I don't think the other party is close enough for him to be able to call out to them. And yeah, I don't. I haven't even really spoken to anybody in the party yet, so I don't know if he would even care to. <laughs> um, but okay. yeah, no. A little wait and see policy. So, um, uh, a second later, uh, you see that there is a bear that is running so what you're seeing it's um it's some kind of local uh fauna it's um it's like a wolf-like creature and a few uh flying mammal creatures uh but they have um they look like they are uh partially decomposed and like they are held together by this um dark purple gelatinous fluid that is uh kind of uh wrapped around and encasing their body um and so in the parts where uh you know maybe a part of their shoulder is missing and it shouldn't work um this this fluid seems to be what it's like holding the gaps together uh and these three creatures which are of um three different species, even though two of them have the same sprite, um, all seem to be working together to uh, chase down this bear. Um, the bear is uh, backing. Uh, its back is now up against a wall of trees, and it does not have... Um, doesn't have anywhere further that it can run. It's, it's tried pushing through the shrubs um and i think it is now turning around and realizing that it is backed into a corner um as uh these things approach um do you do anything nope okay then i i, I don't i don't see any reason to do anything <laughs> right i mean like oh these things are attacking a bear i don't know that bear i don't know oh, those yeah. things yeah. Um, <laughs> so, uh, all three of them uh, descend upon it in quick order. Uh, 
it's slashing at them. Uh, it's sending chunks of meat and uh, purple goop flying. Um, they are tearing away at it, and you can see that it is getting uh, more and more injured. And at this point, um, uh, this strange little fairy critter thing leads um, Nock and Kayla uh, up the path just behind uh, Nazar. So you two are uh, seeing this as well. Um, so you guys, you see Nazar just kind of watching. Um, and you see this bear that is being descended upon by these three monstrous, not natural seeming creatures. Uh, and uh, the creature in front of you, the little fairy creature, starts um, yipping and uh, like runs over towards it and then stops to see if you are following. I'll follow the fairy creature. Okay. Um, so it is. Uh, it runs up to the bear and starts doing something that seems vaguely magical uh, with the bear, but you don't know the details just yet. So um, we're going to roll initiative, I think. Um, assuming you are going to. You guys are going to help the fairy creature in defending this bear. Um, Sorry, I don't have music for this. Um, I'm working through getting a playlist up. How about... Um, the, um, the battle one was a little too intense for this one. This seems a little lower stakes than like... I, okay. I feel like Nazar would ask the, the fairy creature if it's yipping so much. It's like, why? What? what are you trying to get us to do? Why do you want us to help that bear? What is this? Why? Uh, it it is not able to respond to you in your language. Uh, you don't even know if it understands your language. Um, but it is uh, it is very concerned about protecting this bear. It seems to be doing something to to maybe heal or protect the bear with some kind of magic and um and also is starting to get hit in the conflict. So, um... Okay, so then Nazar would turn back towards the other party members and say, look, I know I'm pretty new here. Is this is this normal? <laughs> like, these butterfly things and this giant wolf are attacking this bear. I don't, I don't I have no idea what's going on. <laughs> what is this all about? I was just trying to find, like, somewhere to plug in my guitar and amp. What are we doing? The creature seems vaguely magical. Maybe it functions as an outlet? <laughs> Alright, so magic is a thing. Okay, okay, this is fucking hilarious. Alright, okay. So, do we help the bear? What if it eats us? I don't know. I feel like this uh, magical creature is trying to get our attention. So maybe it's, um, maybe it's a nice magical creature? Oh. Huh. Nice magical creature. It's not something Reverend Godshine would, would prove of, but eh, whatever. All right, now Nazar is going to use one of his abilities, but I can't find where my abilities are. Fuck. No, do, you need a, do you need an electrical... Do you need, like, an amp or anything? Like, how I do don't you... know. You guys said it was magic here. I just plug it into the ground or something. <laughs> uh, so I think you have 12. Uh, so... Uh, 12 to Zai. Um, Zai, in roll yeah. three, just above your character name, you should have a deck of cards that says 12. You see that? Just above my character name? On the map or on my on sheet? The map. On, um, on the map itself, at the bottom of the map, we have each of our uh, players. Listed. Yeah, okay, yeah. So do you see, see the deck above your name? I see when I hover over the uh, card, it says Nazar deck, choose, remove, draw, discard. So that's on the right side. On the left side, down at the bottom. Oh, down at the bottom. Okay. Okay, right, you see Zyde? Yes. And click that. Click that, uh, and that'll be all of your pertinent information. 
You can just uh, do a quick zoom in a lot. on one of those things, and it will show you. Um, it'll zoom in so you can read the text. Uh, go ahead and start reading through that. Oh. But um, before you're going to be able to act, we have to establish initiative and uh, wait for it to be your turn. Jeff rolled a okay. 19, so he's probably going to go first. Um, I'm looking. I accidentally drew a card. I'm sorry. Now I've done it. <laughs> um, okay. Two of these have plus five. Um, and then the other one. Come on, come on, come on. Has a plus three. Plus roll, d20, plus three. Okay. Um, other people who are in this fight so far. Uh, so everyone except Kevin uh, right. and Morgan. Uh, roll initiative. Um. Oh, did we see this uh, thing in the background? The by the way, the giant building. Yeah, yeah. You would have seen that when you um when you came in. Did I just drop that seriously? Definitely looks like there's an an outlet going to be found in that building. Just saying, is our. Okay, now, Jeff, I'm dealing you all of your starting cards. Okay. These are the cards that you always have available at your disposal. Um, there's also one card for your skills and one card for your stats, for a quick reference. Uh, because you guys are level one, that means the remainder of your deck is four cards, which is not a lot, but it is what it is. Um, Mm. Anais, uh, I'm gonna do the same thing for you. Where's my Anais? Here we go. Anais, Anais, Anais. Click, 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 click. Okay. Anais has seven cards. Sai has all of his cards. Um, we'll deal Kevin in when he arrives. Uh, who has rolled? So um, I got an eight for initiative. Yep, yep, yep. Oh, so we all need to roll initiative. Yep, yep. yep. Um, open your character sheet. There should be an initiative near the top. All right. So you two are tied there. Um, should there be cards here that we didn't discuss, like the miners, minor cards? I guess. They're called minor actions. Um, probably those are probably your um, your base class abilities. Uh, okay, okay. The things you got like, for free for just being your class. Um, okay, because I was like majestic word word of friendship. I would not have picked these. No, they are they are not optional. They are an inherent part of your character. We can okay. change the um, we can change the. Uh, flavor text on them to be something more appropriate. But I do like the so you have word of friendship gives you advantage on uh, diplomacy. I feel like uh, your character would maybe have an advantage on intimidate version of that. Okay. Um, what am I doing? Uh, come on, there is an add to initiative. Here we go. By the way, um, I don't think we're ever going to have like an official.
special name for this creature, because this creature does not speak common. Um, because this character uh, was brought on as a replacement healer for um, to make up for Mike's character being absent, I asked Mike to name them, and Mike said, Oh, that little guy? That's Paxton Oliver. So that little guy's uh, official canonical name is Paxton Oliver. Um, well, these guys? The, the, the little fairy guy. Oh, okay. Um, and then you have a new one. And you have a new Okay, so, yeah, you have the highest initiative. Um, mm-hmm. uh, you can choose to go right away, or you can, uh, Delay your action until some stuff has happened. Uh, oh, I need to add the bear. Oh, do that. Okay, so how how many squares or hexagons can I move in a uh, in a round of okay. movements? Um, one, two, three, four, five, six. So I don't think I can actually hit anybody yet. So, uh, here's the thing you can do. Um, uh, there's an, a thing called a charge action, which is um, you do your regular movement, so that's uh, six squares of movement, and then you do uh, a second move and a basic attack. So a charge action specifically is a standard action that is a full movement with a basic attack at the end of it, but you're allowed to move either before or after your charge action. Um, does, that, does that take the place of um, interaction and move? So, it doesn't. So, uh, that is, you can use the charge if you aren't able to move someone. You can move action to move halfway, and then you can move action as a charge to get a second movement and then move back again. The reason you would use, the reason you would usually not do that if you had the choice is you're just going to be doing a basic attack, which is your weakest attack. Um, well, but, why not? Yeah. Um, so I'll just do a uh, sharp maneuver straight at the um, butterfly and um, charge it. Okay. Um, can you move your character over there? Yep. Okay. Um, now, when we did the demo, you. So I did go through the demo, so you know how to um, use your card. Uh, you can draw two cards, and then, um, actually, you know what? It has to be just a basic effect. So, um, you have, uh, you can, uh, so when you click on your character, in the top left of the screen, you have three options that show up. Two weapon choice, weapon one attack, and weapon two attack, correct? Yeah. Um, so you can uh, do technically any of them. You can do two weapon choice and it'll give you two things, but weapon one attack is good. That just means you don't want to your single eyes. Um, okay, so that is a hit and you're going to do five points of damage. So uh, I you know that you have hit this guy for five points. Um, Next up is... Can I, can I also have a, a canonical, um... For the fury! Very good. Okay. Um... So, I'm just giving this bear some hit points. I'm gonna say this bear is starting the fight at 16 out of 32 hit points. Um... So, it is... Ravenous Wolf turn. Um, the top of the guy open. And then the next is that the next Um, light action, and then. Oh, sorry. Um, I had one other thing. I, I promised I'm not trying to go out of order, but there was a thing I was going to do. Mark the fairy as being um, a sword mark. 
So mark is a thing you do to bad guys. If a bad guy is marked on you, they can't um, attack anyone. Yeah, I've got a special ability that lets me mark an adjacent person each turn, so I'll do that to the very... Okay. Back name... Bite. Uh, target... AC. Attack hold bonus... Six. Damage formula is 1, 2, 10, 3. Uh, target is... Uh, I, I turned on this... I added this new, um, script the other day that lets me make new, uh, attack buttons on the fly. So now that I've made this button, I won't need to rewrite it. I can just, any time that, that, I can just put that button in. Um, okay, so, oh, that's 19, and it's an image from crap. So, the bear has taken, uh, eight points of damage, and is down to, uh, eight of its 32 health. Uh, it is beyond bloody. Uh, and it is grabbed by the wolf. So the wolf had a uh, solid grip on it, and uh, it cannot be. Uh, I kind of icon to grab. Uh, I need some more, uh, more icon. Okay. There is grab. Um next up is the bat. So um I mean look at what the bat has in the cook. Um right. okay. So, I have, um, so, we're going to do the first round of combat, and then maybe, uh, just kind of fast forward to the rest of this, because this isn't an important combat, it's more of just a demo, a tutorial. Um, but, uh, does everyone want to stop at five? Is that a good stopping point? That's when I was going to ask to stop yeah. at Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um... All right, so what's this doing? It is uh, targets a helpless or unconscious creature, takes five psychic damage. Uh, oh yeah, that's totally what's happening. Um, okay, so the first thing that happens is um, the bear is held in place by this wolf that has it grabbed. Uh, this um, northmost bat uh, kind of grabs onto it, and you see that, that purple jello goop that is wrapped around the bat starts growing as if it looks like it's siphoning something out of the bear that is feeding into the goop and making it look bigger. Um, so, let me, let's see, it does not need to roll for this because the target is grabbed, uh, so the bear is going to take another five points of damage. Uh, it takes three hit points. Um, and this bat has, um, what's its max HP? Right. Uh, this bat has a 10 HP shield. Uh, okay. Way too intense. Are you guys able to see the bar that just appeared over this guy? Bar? I don't no. think so. Okay. It's probably um, DM specific. I. That's probably fine. Uh, okay, and then this second bat, uh, who was not able to do that, is going to attack. Yeah. I just attacked it. Um, it's going to do. Uh,
I'm I'm just gonna imagine because we're ending soon that this is this is the song that is being played by uh by Zai. Yeah, by Zai. Yes. Um, <laughs> I want you guys to know that uh, the name of this attack did not come from me. It is uh the the creators of the game, Wizards of the Coast, were the one that decided to name this attack. Andrew Perez. Love that. We have to live in a world where that's the case. Um, Jeff, is your reflex uh, higher than 15? No. Okay, so um, you were caressed by a tendril, and uh, cool. you take five points of psychic damage. I'm um, slightly um, aroused, and I'm not sure how to feel about this. You didn't need to feel psychically damaged. So I'm gonna go ahead and take five off your HP. Yeah, you are able to do your own HP part, correct? No. Oh, actually, it makes it below it, yeah. Yeah, okay, yeah. So I'm just gonna use that a little bit. And uh, now it is Nazar's turn. Um, so Zai, uh, you're one of the characters who have not had a chance to do a demo game yet. Um, mm -hmm. Do you have any questions about the process here? You were able to look through all your cards and see what they did? Yeah. Okay. Um, so, you can move uh, up to six squares and then use any of your cards. Uh, whichever card you want to use, just drop it. You can just drag and drop from your hand onto the board so that you can all see uh, what you Alright, so despite the, uh, the, the, the track being played and the canon of Nizar playing this, I actually wasn't playing this uh, because what I was going to play relates to the card that I'm going to also play. Uh, so, oh, I would do that. So you're doing the wild thing. That's the thing that you're going to be doing. After, once we get to a certain point, you're not going to have to, like, even say that you're doing that anymore. It's just like a thing that you're doing constantly. But, yeah. really noted, you, you polymorph at least part of your body. And you um, hear a strange sound, earth music, that you haven't heard ever before. Can you hear that? Oh. 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 I hear something. I hear chanting? Or... Damn, you don't hear any of that. Wild. Uh, I got this up loud as shit. But oh, whatever the case, all right. He starts playing Eye of the Tiger. <laughs> That's very good. Okay, so you're doing Eye of the Tiger, and um, uh, and I partly change into a tiger, like okay. thing. I think uh, just the pause. So uh, the thing at which point I drop my guitar. Like what the? <laughs> this is the first time that's ever happened. So the wild thing you just played is a minor action, which uh basically doesn't count against the action you can do. So, still do one of your attacks. Um, okay. So but, well, after I do Wild move, Shape, I would move to... Savage Rank? And attack this guy. Okay. Uh, do you want to use Savage Rend as your attack? Yeah. Alright, so just drag that onto the field so we can all see it. Ah, oh, shit. Where'd it go? Right there. Okay, um, click on your character, and if I did it right, in the top left, you should get three buttons that pop up. It says uh, two weapon choice, weapon one attack, weapon two attack. Do you see that? My left clicking? Oh, two weapon choice, weapon attack, weapon, yeah. So click on two weapon choice. Unrecognized command. Uh, is your character selected? Yeah. Possible I broke it. Whatever. I'll figure out why that wasn't happening. Um, so, let me check. So this one doesn't use your axe, it uses your implement. So you're going to use that second option. Guitar implements. So in the chat field... I click that. Yep. Uh, there should be three buttons. You want to click the button that says roll attack with guitar implements. Uh -huh. 
Um, and I'm guessing I should do this with strength. Uh, no, so this is a uh, wisdom versus reflex. It says on the card. Um, so attack is wisdom. The target defense <laughs> is nice. reflex. Thanks, uh, um, the uh, damage is 1 to 8 plus wisdom. Wait, so what was the other attack bonus? That was the first thing that popped up. Wisdom. It's a number value I need to type in, not a... I'll just uh, let me cancel this card over. Okay, click roll attack with guitar. IMPL, which attack tributes to attack, uh, to use. Wisdom, submit, then says other attack bonus. Oh, just say none, or zero, and then click OK. okay. Hits with amount. Hit W amount. Um, that is zero. All right, it defaults to one, but I'll change it to zero. All right, which attribute is added to damage? Wisdom again? Uh, wisdom. Uh, yeah, I might, I might have to change that. I hadn't. This is the first time I've had a spell thing come up for that. Um, okay, uh, we're gonna. Just, uh, Um, so that's a 10 attack, uh, and then, uh, 9 total damage if it hits. Um, let me check this dude's AC. Uh, does that, that does target AC, correct? Uh, no, versus reflex. Yeah, reflex. Um, no, so it, uh, it actually is going to flit out of the way, and your uh, tiger claw passes right underneath it. Um, you, you missed it, not by much, um, but uh, it's, uh, I'm sure you are already having a reaction to the fact that you just grew a tiger claw. Um, so... Uh, what you can do now is just right-click on those two cards you put down and say, take card. Okay. And that'll put them both back into your hand for next turn. All right. Uh, I think we're going to have just enough time to finish this turn. Do what we want. Um, Anaeus. So I dealt you uh, your seven cards. Um, no, you haven't done a demo game yet, so I haven't shown you how to do... Um, how to draw cards. So, Aeneas, um, you know what? Uh, is it alright if I screen share for a second to show you how to do this? Yeah. Okay. Um, share your screen. Click. Uh, wait, hold on. Okay, so on Discord, you can see my screen? Okay. Yeah. So, this is your deck. It's got a little picture of the person who you are. Kayla? Kayla. Kayla. Okay. So, you take your deck that has a little picture of Kayla. You flip and drag, and you see I, I picked up a card? Yeah. Now, if you let go now, it'll just put it on the field. Uh, if I let go now, it'll just put it on the field. When I mouse over your character's name, do you see how a little yellow line appeared around the word Aeneas? Yeah. That's when I left out, and that puts it into your hand. Okay. So go ahead and do that, because you get two cards every turn. So draw from okay. the deck, put it over Aeneas, and... Uh, there you go! Okay, so now you have uh, cards in your hand that you can work with. Your character, remember, uh, can attack two spaces away uh, naturally. Um, and... Uh, and you've got a few other abilities that, that let you, like, stretch your attacks and stuff. Um, So, 
You can move up to six steps, up to six squares, before attacking. Uh, if you use Shade Slash, uh, you can attack even further, but it does a bit less damage. Um, uh, you could use Dark Fire, that just helps you with accuracy. Uh, you can use Shadow Storm. Uh, that does probably your most damage, especially because these enemies are kind of packed together. So, uh, if you did Shadow Storm on this lowermost bat creature, you would hit it fairly hard. Um, so, that's probably what I recommend. What do you think? Yeah, let's go for it. So, you're gonna want to get, um, to a place where you can, um, you know, you only have to be two squares away if you've got room to play the whip. Uh, let's see. Two, four, five, or five, or six. Um, so, places you could end, if you stop here, you would be able to attack between your ally and hit him with your whip. Or, you could stop here and be next to the fairy creature and kill him with a hit him. Yeah, I think I'm gonna stay where I'm at now. Okay. So, uh, go ahead and take that card you were just looking at, the Shadow Storm, and drop it on the table. Drag and drop. I think I did. Yeah, you did it. Okay. Um, so, uh, go ahead and uh, click on your character and get that same green button option in the top left that everyone has been showing everyone. Um, yeah. If you click two weapon choice, it'll generate those buttons that you can click, or you could just go ahead and do weapon one attack, which is your primary weapon. Uh, the two weapon choice is giving me the unrecognized command, but I can use weapon one attack. Uh, do I want to just keep it on none for attribute added to attack? Uh, no, uh, that's carry. Add that's carry. And then, and then other attack bonus is zero? Zero. You are targeting AC. Uh, hits W mount, uh, take that down to zero? Nope, that's, uh, one W plus X carry. And then the uh, dexterity is added to damage, you said. Okay, and this also has plus one damage for each creature adjacent to the target. So that has one, two, three, four dudes adjacent to it. So that is going to be uh, 19 is a solid hit. You did uh, eight plus four damage, 12 damage to this dude. Uh, and he is very dead. So you, uh... Can, can I, like, snatch him back towards me with my whip and eat him? I want to eat him. I'm going to eat his body. Oh, okay, we're going to... I think we're going to address... If you just got to the end of the turn, that's actually going to have consequences, and we're going to address that next game. Um, yes! But, so, so, in case it is a little, a little preview, I think that Aeneas' character and my character are going to be a lot of art. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, in case anybody doesn't know, um, in Ace's weapon, it's a, um, it's a whip very similar to the one in the Captain Aeneas movie, the, the metal whip. Um, so it is... Like, Richter's rip? Yeah, yeah. but for the, the second, the last few seasons. Uh, there's a metal, uh, a fine metal chain that is about, um... I'm just gonna try to keep it off. Too long, maybe? And at the end of this chain is a metal weight. Uh, so it's actually closest to um, to a what is called a meteor hammer in Eastern martial arts. Uh, so you throw that, and it just that that weight of yours just blasts straight through this thing's rotting carcass. And uh, on the other end of it, I think you twist your wrist your wrist a little bit so that it wraps around the guy and you pull it and it flies back to you and you now have a a dead rotting orc thing. Yum. Congratulations. Okay. 
Um, you're going to, uh, we're going to end the game just about now. You are biting into that thing. The last thing that's going to happen before the last action of the game is, uh, this little dude, Paxton, is going to do a bite. Uh, or something. I don't know what he's going to do. So, Paxton is going to do, let's see, Detecting Sprite, um, and each ally adjacent gains temporary hit points, uh, Voice of Battle, can shift, uh, Spirit Shield, that's an opportunity attack, Standard Action, to make a melee basic attack, that's a minor action. Okay, so here's what it's doing. Um, it's going to shift up this way. It's going to use... Oh, um, Anais, can you right-click on this card you played and say, take card? Okay. Got it. So, um, first, it is going to use Healing Spirit. Um, the target can spend a Healing Surge and heal an additional, uh three hit points. Um, this guy's healing surge is going to heal for eight, so three plus eight plus three is fourteen. Yes. Uh, so he goes from three HP up to fourteen HP. Um, one ally adjacent to the spirit companion uh, other than the target, regains 1d6 hit points. Uh, so he could have done that while he was back here, but you don't need to recover hit points, so that would have, wouldn't matter. Uh, all allies adjacent to Spirit Companion may shift one square. Uh, all right, let's say he did it while he was here. Uh, Aeneas, would you like to shift one square in a direction? It means you can move without getting an attack of opportunity. Yeah, I think I want to shift with him just because of the whole possible so both me eating a bat. <laughs> Maybe I could use his healing energy. <laughs> yeah, so you guys are shifting like that. So you're going yeah. to be he's going to be there. Uh, just so you know, I've been ignoring difficult terrain for this whole fight. In the future, a fight like this would be much more complicated because of difficult terrain and you guys having trouble standing in places that are inside these trees and stuff like that. We're not doing that right now. Um, so, uh, you have shifted, he did his, uh, spirit heal on the bear, um, and then there was this kind of, like, gust of wind as he moved that pulled you with him, um, and then he is going to use, uh, which one did I want you to use? Was it this one? Yeah. Okay. And then he's going to use Protecting Strife. Um, wisdom versus Will. Uh, 1d8 plus Wisdom modifier damage. Uh, and each ally adjacent. Okay. Um... Wisdom, Bureau, added to damage, Wisdom, damage formula is 1d8. Come on, roll. All right, so this is versus Will. Um, that's definitely higher than this thing's Will check. Um, that is uh, 6 points of damage total, and each ally adjacent to your spirit companion gains uh, three temporary hit points. So, um, uh, Avalon, or, oh god, oh, oh god, so many times. Um, okay. That's like doubly, yes, that's I like know. doubly insulting. So, um, Hala, uh, hey, Kayla, uh, click on your character, and above your head, you should have uh, three fields you can fill in. You have a red that says 25, 
a green that says eight and a blue that says zero. You see those? Mm -hmm. uh, turn that blue up to three. Okay. That is your temporary hit points. It's kind of like a uh, energy shield. It's um, you'll lose that before you lose your normal health. Oh, sweet. Um, and the bear also got that. And uh, this little bat thing lost six hit points, um, which all came out of it. It's temporary hit points. Uh, so probably the next attack is going to kill that thing. Um, now, the turn is over. We're going to go to the top of round two. We're not going to do anything in round two, I promise. Um, oh, it's the bear's turn. Uh, I think the bear struggles and manages to get the wolf off of, off of it, and then it kicks the wolf uh, one square away. There are actions I could have done to do that, but it happens. Um, now... Beginning of turn two, here's what happens. Uh, uh, eh, eh, God, stupid new character names. Ezrock and Krisha uh, come in. Uh, you see, you hear some fighting from off in the distance. You come sprinting in or maybe flying down from above. And um, you see uh, the fight happening up ahead. So next, uh, next time we play, you guys will be thrown into the top of the turn order and get to, get to throw yourselves into the melee here. Um, I thought maybe we would be able to get the... the um, the timing better on this and get Morgan in this first game. Morgan, I'm very sad. I'm very sorry we didn't uh we didn't get you into this first game. But it's all good. No worries. But I have a thing for you. So Yeah. It'll be good. Um hold on just a second. Uh <laughs> So uh, I'm going to move everyone over to a new map. Uh, so, so this is where we're ending for today. We're going next game. We're going to pick up at the top of turn two, and uh, that fight's going to be over by the end of turn two. I promise. Uh, but I want to give you a little preview of the house that uh, you're going to see next turn. Uh, where was is my... Is it supposed to be blank right now? It is blank currently, because okay. I was not good and didn't make my maps ahead of time. Well, I did make my maps, I just didn't put them in. Uh, so I need this, I need my maps, I need my cabin interior. And... All right. Uh, so everyone can see this this new thing that I just put down. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and um, recenter us. So uh, you guys see the new map with the new thing I just put down. Just as a little preview, I'm going to go ahead and show you guys. There is a construct in this building. And that that will be our little uh, post credit scene cliffhanger. So next game, we'll finish that fight. You guys will meet the construct, and we will decide what's going on. Okay. All right. Good stuff. Yeah. I hope that the music wasn't too, like, all over the place. I was no, trying we were, to... we were figuring it out. You did pretty good. Yeah, I'm going to... Um... Before next, before we play next, give you can give me like a couple of main themes and mm -hmm. a couple of scenes to like do the work for, and I'll come up with some playlists that I don't have to skip through quite as much. Yeah, cool. Yep. Um, okay, so uh, so that uh, should give everyone uh, an idea of what to do now before we end. 
we're going to start and end every game on this page. And uh, so far, we only have one thing we need to do at the end of every game. Uh, we need to determine who was the VIP of this game. Uh, so who experienced... <laughs> How did I make that mistake? <laughs> Okay, we are going to determine... Who's the vice president of the game? I got it. <laughs> Who is the secretary of defense of the game? <laughs> no. No, I can do this. <laughs> I'm so sorry, Brand. Why is it white now? It's okay. <laughs> okay. We're gonna... It works. It works. Okay, we're determining the MVP. So... Uh, this is going to be a bit weird for our first game, where very little happened and we don't know each other's characters very well. It's not me, I got lost in the woods. Who did the most of the following? Experienced significant personal growth or overcame a personal trial, saved the day or made a significant personal sacrifice, or made a profound personal connection or had a dramatic role-playing moment. I would posit, of those three... Um, the closest that I could think of would maybe be, um, uh, hey. We should have players just vote on it. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, Avalyn, I vote. Nope, Hala. Damn it! No! Oh! Hala, Hala for what? I'm not sure if it is. Ah, she's gone. <laughs> That'll be a great way to get everyone to stop saying it every time yeah. somebody accidentally says Avalyn Roy or Zai just has to come in with the Mendenshire voice, like, Oh, are you looking her name? I'll break my way into these shards and I'll see you again. So <laughs> Hela I vote Hela for eating the guy at the end. Oh, I was gonna say Hela too. Um Well that was a personal sacrifice in some ways. Um and it is a personal trial she's going to have to overcome later in the bathroom. Um, uh, That's another <laughs> sneak preview of things to come. I, um, <clears throat> I was going to propose Zai for um, a role-playing moment of realizing he could polymorph. And Zai's character oh. is, of course, named Mazar. Um, does anyone else have any, uh, what's it called? Person you put forward for the thing. Yeah, I also vote Nassar for the same reasons. That, that, that moment where his paws transformed and he was just like, ah, it was so good. <laughs> I'll vote. I enjoyed, I enjoyed Nazar's um, ability to not be completely consumed by the moment and, uh, basically stayed, I don't know that bear. That was my <laughs> Okay. All right. That was fun. That was fun to play. I was gonna say Hila just because of the whole eating of the thing and because like her attack actually did shit <laughs> like yeah. on the first try and it was pretty significant. Mm. I'm good with that. I'm good with Nazar. So with Nazar, so um, because you are MVP, you're going to earn one extra. I think we're calling them hero points. They're called action points in here. Um, the important thing is, it's a thing that, it's basically a guaranteed success at something. So, I just bumped you from, everybody begins every chapter with one action point. I just bumped Nazar up to two action points, and, um, the only way to get those is... The one you get at the beginning of the chapter, or being the MVP. So, um, for being the MVP, Nazar has gone from one guaranteed success up to two guaranteed successes. Yep. Um, okay, so... Uh, we did it! We survived our first game and the epilogue of the previous game. Hooray! Yay! Yay! I'm so relieved. <laughs> I'm gonna go sleep.
an undisturbed, <laughs> peaceful sleep for like 13 hours. Nice. <laughs> Enjoy that. Anxiety. Good game, y'all. Good game. Yeah, it was a good game. All right. Bye, everybody. All right. Bye. Bye, everyone. Bye.